Hello, everybody. We're going to get started in a little bit. Happy that you've joined us. So stay tuned. Waiting for the folks to come into the room now, and we'll get started shortly. Zay, your, your fan called this here. Uh, good morning. I'm not sure what time zone you're in. Eric, are you traveling? Uh, it's, it's, it's nice, uh, you know, hello, Seth. I, I noticed Seth's uh, chat for the... Uh, Folks here on the back side of the webinar that Seth's chat was to everyone. So we want to make sure we have all the right parameters on the chat. Great. There's Max. Hello, Max. Come on in, Max. Sorry about that, everybody. Technical difficulty. It's okay. All good. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. Happy to have you in our group. Um, uh, so Aaron uh, from Propelify, if you can share a link uh, into the chat here, I'll, I'll post it to everyone. Um, great conference coming up in Hoboken on October 6th. So uh, definitely want to acknowledge our friends at Propelify and encourage you to check it out. All right. I'll make a note. Voila. So there you go. Um, so free ticket. Thank you. Um, much appreciated. So I encourage people to take advantage. All right, thanks for your patience, everyone. If you're looking for the Founder Institute Keystone chapter, you're in it, or at least you're gonna get a taste of what we're all about here in our chapter in the Philadelphia area. We're committed to providing these types of engaging educational webinars to support the founders in not only in the Philadelphia area, but the surrounding Delaware Valley, New Jersey, New York, and all of Pennsylvania. Tonight's webinar is going to be testament, kind of an indication of the quality programming that we provide to engage founders and to support them with professional development and added resources such as this. Before we get started in introducing our overall panelists and diving into the topic of finding founder success at any age, I'd like to introduce you all to Don Samoyo, who is the Founder Institute Keystone Lead. Greetings all, thank you for joining. Um, I think hopefully you're all familiar with Founders Do, you know, world's largest pre-seed accelerator. So, um, you know, we've got chapters all across the world. I've invited uh, some of our friends from, you know, various chapters. So if you're in from a number of uh, the chapters in Latin America that we've, you know, invited or across the U.S., Canada, and uh, uh, even in some of the time zones where this is uh, difficult for you, thank you for joining. Um, so uh, we, we've got some sponsors that have joined us and uh, hopefully they are sending me links and whatever so that I can uh, put their info out there and acknowledge them. Um, but otherwise, uh, Pam, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Don. And to expand upon what Don just said about the 
foundation of all we do is really, it, it takes place in our pre-seed accelerator. And our new member recruitment is taking place right now. And it's gonna be closing soon, but we're still recruiting members for our next cohort of in our pre-seed accelerator. Uh, it's kind of like the brand is like that mini MBA for founders to support you and give you the information and knowledge that you need to be successful. Uh, so we will be putting links to that in the uh, chat for you to get access to. And also, if you just piqued your curiosity, just take note that we're going to have an open house this Friday at 12 o'clock Eastern time and Saturday at 1030 Eastern time. That's just kind of open house office hours. Come with any of your questions and curiosities and somebody from the team will be there to give you some information on the Founder Institute Keystone cohort for the next accelerator program. We're here tonight to explore age as it relates to meeting with success as a founder. And the, the basis of why we chose this program, we were kind of inspired by uh, Kumar Mehta's article uh, that he published on Forbes that explored this topic of ageism within being successful in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, as I like to say. So I wanna welcome um, Kumar, but before um, we go into depth about that, let's start off with Kumar. I'm gonna go around the room and ask the panelists to introduce themselves. So Kumar, why don't you lead us off? Hi everybody, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Kumar and uh, uh, just in, in, by way of a quick background, uh, the early part of my career was at Microsoft. I live in Seattle, I still do. Um, I spent about 14 years at Microsoft, and then at a later stage of my career in life, I decided to become an entrepreneur, and I left Microsoft after 14 years and, uh, and was the CEO of a company that we basically started and grew. And uh, somehow, we were one of the fortunate ones. Uh, our company did well. We uh, we ended up uh, ha hiring about a thousand people around the world, and after we sold uh, one of our divisions to <clears throat> Nielsen, the company that tracks your TVs, uh, I decided to pursue some uh, some of my personal passions and and some of the things I've been wanting to do for most of my professional uh, life, which is research and write about interesting topics. And I published a couple of books. My first book was called The Innovation Biome. Uh, which is uh, the story of innovation and how innovation happens. And my most recent book is called The Exceptionals. And for that, I interviewed the most exceptional people in the world, uh, people who had won uh, Nobel Prizes, Olympic gold medalists, uh, athletes, musicians, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, business leaders, architects, just people who had really scaled the top, who had, reached the, who had become exceptional in their field. And I tried to understand what are the common elements across all of these individuals in these different fields. And so that was a fascinating project. And uh, now I, I, uh, I, I give talks, I mentor uh, entrepreneurs. Um, I write, which is how uh, my article came about uh, over here. And uh, this article was an interesting article because it was just trying to understand these misconceptions, especially people, uh, West Coast people where you know, uh, people in, in, the, in the Valley have about, hey, let's get these young, smart, you know, no holds barred kind of entrepreneurs and invest in them and see where they go. And uh, the truth is uh, that, you know, some of them may be successful, but experience and learning from your job plays a huge role in how successful you can be uh, if you become a founder. So I think that's the topic we're going to talk about today. So once again, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us, Kumar. Peter, do you want to take it from there and tell us a little bit about you and what you do within the world of founders and entrepreneurship? Sure, sure. Thanks, Pam. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm Peter Hornberger. I work at Penn State Abington campus, about 10 miles north of Center City, Philadelphia. And I also run and manage their Launchbox program, which is a statewide initiative. There's 21 centers across the Penn State network that provide programming, support, uh, maker spaces, co-working spaces, all different across our state to help uh, engage a community of entrepreneurship and innovation. 
I kind of got my start uh, not that far from where I sit right now. Um, my family, uh, my grandfather, my father, my mother, they were all accountants. Um, and that's how I started uh, in the business at 13, helping my father do income statements on, uh, at that point, Lotus 1, 2, 3. So I guess that puts me probably in the old category since uh, I, it started with some different technology than we're used to. Um, and uh, somehow fell into a kind of this entrepreneurship and education combined connection point. So I've gotten a chance to work at several different universities, which helped me to uh, support and develop entrepreneurship training for high school programs. So we do high school programs at Penn State Abington. I did them at Widener University. But I also was fortunate, I spent about five years working as a trainer with the United States uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Foundation. And they had a program called BizFest, they still do, uh, that goes around the country and provides uh, high level four day trainings for student entrepreneurship. Uh, and that's really where my, my foundation, my key interests lie in, in youth entrepreneurship and, and helping uh, at least open up or uh, allowing students to explore that pathway as a potential career for themselves as they move forward. That's all I've got, Pam. Thank you, Peter. Looking forward okay. to what you can bring to the uh, conversation here with the perspective, both sides of being a more seasoned entrepreneur worker and also um, with, you know, spending your daily lives with the uh, younger set or the young folks. Uh, so Kylie, how about you tell us about yourself? Yeah, for sure. And, and thank you for having me and excited to hop on this call. Um, as far as just kind of my background, so I'm still a student at the University of Minnesota, um, but I run a student run fund called Atlan Ventures. Uh, we've been around since about 2018. I've been involved for the past four years. Um, and we look at seed stage companies, industry agnostic. Um, outside of Atland, I worked for an angel investor for about two years on portfolio management. And then this past summer helped co-found um, well, co-founder and support two different startups, one in the ed tech space and one in the CPG space. Welcome, Kylie. Appreciate the perspective that you're going to be able to provide us on this panel. Zave, tell us a little bit about yourself. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Zave Smith. I am a serial entrepreneur. My latest venture is Xbound. Uh, Xbound is a startup with a mission. We are here to help businesses and nonprofits benefit from the wisdom, the experience, and even the technical knowledge of later career and semi-retired talent. Again, another unique perspective. So thank you for joining us. Look forward to your expertise. And Max, tell us a little bit about yourself as a founder. Thanks, Pam. Hey, everybody. For those that I haven't met, nice to meet you. For those that I have, good to see you again. Uh, so my name is Max Talheimer. I am uh, the 25-year-old, since I suppose that's relevant in this context, founder of a company called Find, which I'm pleased to uh, announce is taking off currently here in, uh, in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, where I'm based. Um, additionally, I also am pleased to be an entrepreneur in residence for the Keystone chapter of the Founder Institute. I've also been serving as an early stage venture coach for Northeastern University's Venture Accelerator for the last four plus years. So happy to be here lending my perspective. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated, Max. Looking forward to your uh, expertise and insight here. And uh, uh, with that, I uh, like to just say I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Pam Knox, and I'm on the leadership team here at Founders Institute uh, Keystone Chapter. And uh, my business is Pam Knox LLC, and I help entrepreneurs uh, craft their messaging, perfect their pitch, and position themselves for success at any age. I'll work with all ages of entrepreneurs. Um, so let's go back to uh, Kumar here um, and uh, just give me a high level on that article, the um, older entrepreneurs outperforming uh, younger founders is that teaser premise for the article he wrote for Forbes. Um, if you could just tell me, you know, what the, the feedback's been, what kind of the reaction's been and, and what were the surprises that you encountered? Yeah, uh, so so we have this common view uh, that uh, you know big bold ideas come from you know people with fresh ideas, people who aren't caught up in in a certain way of doing things, people who uh, you know uh, since we're speaking about age, uh, people who are young because they they just don't have the baggage that that people who worked in a job for five, ten, twenty years do, and. Uh, and, and this is a very a predominant uh, uh, VCs here, at least on the West Coast, that kind of have this mold 
and they try to match a certain pattern. Uh, even people like Mark Zuckerberg have said that younger people are just smarter. And you know, if I'm around my kids, I certainly feel that way. Uh, uh, Peter Thiel, a, 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 a prominent VC here, he has a fellowship program of $100,000 that basically says that if you're younger than 23 and are willing to uh, drop out of school to start a company, you know, I'm going to give you $100,000. So there's this kind of uh, thinking that the greatest companies are going to be founded by young founders. And that certainly is true because we've seen, you know, incredible companies like, you know, Facebook or Microsoft or Apple or all these phenomenal companies that are started by young founders. But there have been just as many, if not more companies started by founders later in their lives. Uh, and, and that's what I, I read this research. I came across this research, which was this elaborate study done by researchers from MIT, Wharton, uh, the U.S. Census Bureau, and uh, a few other places that kind of collaborated together, looked at like, a, you know, many, many databases and uh, connected all the dots. And they basically said that the average age of a founder uh, uh, is 42 years old. And when we look at those unicorns, those one in 1,000 companies that just do phenomenally well, uh, the average age of those uh, is, uh, companies is 45. And so this completely uh, kind of defied conventional thinking. And I decided to dig deeper into the article and write about it, or dig deeper into the research and write an article about it. Uh, and then there's certain reasons why this happens. It's, uh, uh, it's because people have more experience, people who been in professional uh, lives uh, uh, are more better able to self fund uh, at least uh, for the seed uh, for the seed part of their funding. Uh, they have a higher bar for success. So there are certain uh, reasons that this happens. But I just wanted to bring it out that hey, you know, uh, age is not necessarily uh, one way or the other kind of a, a barrier as you get older. And in fact, the, the research shows that a, a 50 year old founder is twice as likely as a 30 year old founder. To, uh, to have a company that has a successful exit or an IPO. And it kind of fits into my thinking, uh, into my real world, because uh, I, I kind of had to look back uh, uh, as I was preparing for this webinar, that I left Microsoft after 14 years at the age of, I think it was like 43 or 44. Uh, so I'm, I'm one of those quote unquote older founders that, uh, that experience success. So I can actually relate to, uh, to this as being a uh, kind of an older entrepreneur. So that's kind of what the article was about. And I'd love to hear, I mean, you've got a great panel. I'd love to hear everyone's perspectives because uh, it'd just be an interesting uh, view. Thank you. You know, it's, <laughs> you, you, you sparked my curiosity because you're putting the 44, 43 year old in the basket of an older entrepreneur. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we need to define what the parameters are of, of the, you know, for the purpose of this discussion or just keep it in the back of your mind that it's so fueled by this discussion, I suspect is gonna be fueled by people's perspective. It's the lens that we look out from, even you referenced Mark Zuckerberg. He certainly was looking out of a lens of a young guy um, who met with great success and um, you know, might've been more apt to put people in that smart basket. But for all that, you also have the flip side. And my goal here tonight is to present both sides. You know, so, you know, if I lead off with a question that's geared towards young, you know, feel free to counterpart it with the more seasoned uh, viewpoint, whether it's from your experience as a seasoned entrepreneur, uh, older founder, or you work with them, or just from, you know, quota source or whatever. So I would, I would think that, you know, it's, it's not always smooth sailing, as you know, in the, the life of a founder. Um, so what has been your experience of overcoming obstacles as someone who is young? And I'm going to ask that of Max. Yeah, happy to, happy to chime in here. Um, you know, obviously speaking only from, from the only viewpoint that I have, um, that being the one of, of a young founder, first time founder who has, uh, you know, begun to find some success, but certainly still has a long way to go and a long way to grow both uh, I say that about my company and, and as myself, as a founder, um, always try to be cognizant of, of that. Um, I think that one of the things that I found is really interesting, uh, you know, as part of the young founder experience is that it's, it's one of the, it's certainly an instance where you benefit from a stereotype. Um, you know, I think that there's this, this 
image that uh, that was alluded to of these young founders that we put on pedestals, you know, sort of being the the gold standard. They're young, they're hip, they have the you know, the new ideas, and and I think that that's certainly true, and and we like to romanticize that. But there are disadvantages to being a young founder um, to the point where, Kumar, I don't find some of the statistics that you shared to be particularly shocking. Um, you know, I think that young founders, while they do benefit from that stereotype, and there are certainly people out there who, who will open doors for them because of that, you know, I think that there are certain things that we lack um, just inherently based on the stage of life that we're at. Uh, for example, industry knowledge. Some of the most successful founders that I've met, um, you know, have worked for the man, so to speak, um, worked in a certain industry or various industries for years before striking out on their own once they realized that there was a pain point that they were now very well equipped and well connected to solve. Um, you know, another thing that that brings into the discussion is the idea of a network. Um, you know, my network is, is stretches as far and as wide as I've been able to stretch it at this point. And yet, you know, these things take time. Um, and I continue to grow my network every day. I, I appreciate the people that have already reached out to me on LinkedIn here. I, I look forward to chatting with you in the future. Um, you know, and, and things like that uh, are certainly a factor as well. But at the same time, being a young founder, uh, we do have an abundance of certain resources as well that older founders may not. Um, we have a lot of time. Uh, we have a lot of time to learn and we have a, a distinct lack of commitments in most cases. Um, you know, it's it's an interesting thing to think about, but. I'm not sure how much I'd be able to do what I'm doing were I further along in life with a house, a car, a wife, a family. Um, you know, these are all things that I am, uh, have not reached yet in life that I look forward to having one day. Um, so for me, I, I guess to sum it all up, I think that there are certainly barriers that young founders face, um, but there are also certain advantages that we can take advantage of. I think the risk profile that I'm willing to take on at this stage of my life is, is probably a lot higher than it would be otherwise. Thank you for that perspective, uh, Max. It, it makes me think of another question. It, you know, when you bring up the risk, is you know how might age of the founder impact how they just approach entrepreneurship in general? Um, it, it may be different from the more seasoned founder. Peter, what has been your experience? Yeah. So, I, Max, what, what when you were talking about you know your age and what it's meant, it, it reminds me of a, a concept that I, I I learned about in uh, I think it was in an adult education uh, graduate program I was in, where we kind of only have two states of being: we can either attend to something, or we can attend away from something. So, if we're attending to our startup, whether we choose to or not, we're choosing to attend away from our family, our schoolwork, our uh, health, our so. Um, one of the possible benefits of being young, as you mentioned, is maybe we just have less things that we are on our list of, of uh, attending to priorities. And I still think that there's plenty of things to do when you're young. So I, I still think that there is an absolute full list of things that I'm sure a younger version of Max still had a full list, but they're different. And I think as you get older, your list gets less flexible. And so I, I don't want to diminish young people having... Um, less things to attend to but i think as we uh, is, i think you have more flexibility maybe when you're young in what you can attend away from and not have dramatic impacts like if we if i attend away from just my personal health and diet for one day when i step on the scale the next morning it's a dramatic impact when i, when I was 22 it didn't seem to matter all that much so i, I think some of the things pam and and, and building off of what max was talking about i, I think that's what i i see with with um, youth and the thing we, we can't go back, we cannot regain our youth, uh, but we can work with people, uh, young people. And I think that's one of the ways we can, uh, even as we, we uh, move down that timeline into the age of older founders is staying connected uh, with young people and learning about um, flexibility. Because I also have to question as I, I'm approaching that uh, crossing right over that uh, mid forties line where I guess I'm old now, um, Maybe the flexibility is something that I've placed on myself. Um, so maybe, maybe Max, there isn't anything magical about being 25. Maybe, maybe I've stopped allowing the magic to be there. I've, I've limited my flexibility. And I think that's just something to consider that uh, young, old, uh, at least we internally get to decide some of the things that we prioritize and, and do. I'm listening to it. So we have uh, flexibility and lack of commitment. Um, and the, the, maybe the perceived abundance of time, depending upon how you're looking at it. 
it might be factors that open up the door to success of a younger entrepreneur. Uh, what are some of the things that might open the door to success for a more seasoned entrepreneur? Zave. This discussion reminds me of a Bob Dylan line. Uh, I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. And I, I think that being an older founder, I'm, I'm probably the oldest founder in this group. Um, the irony of it is I think you can take a longer term view of both life and of your business. You have uh, been through, I've been through 30 plus years of running my own companies. I know that there's gonna be lots of hiccups. I know the potholes and I've developed the armor and the grit to just deal with them. It just, when something happens, that's a problem. It's just a problem. It's not the end of the world. Um, so you develop a, a little more of a, a long-term view. You have that internal knowledge that whatever problems come your way, you can probably overcome them. But of course, there's some that you can't. Um, and you just keep carrying on. On the, the inverse of that, though, is as a older founder, is sometimes you just don't have quite the energy you had when you were 20. You're not willing or not able to maybe do those 15, 20 hours a day, six, seven days a week for months on end. But on the other hand, because of your knowledge and hopefully knowledge of the industry you're working in, you've developed enough business acumen and wisdom that you actually don't have to work that hard. You can just work that much smarter. So you might, you know, there's many times that I'm faced with an issue that younger people might spend a day or two or three on, I can do in an hour or two just because I've been there and done that. So I think there's pluses and minuses to both. I think one of the problems of an older founder is not to get stuck in your ways or stuck in your old thinking. But if you're an older founder with a curious mind and a flexible attitude, I think it's a great time to start a company, uh, especially if you can find a young person to help, uh, help you propel it forward so you can get the best of all those worlds. Even a middle-aged guy or someone really old like in their 40s. I feel like I'm going to feel ancient by the time I get done this. <laughs> Pam, I'm still got about 20 years on you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Kylie, I'm, I'm curious as to your uh, perspective working um, in a university environment, uh, largely young um, founders and, and uh, startups. And how, how do you see them, the advantages that they have or what's making them successful uh, receiving funding in your area? Yeah, for sure. So I work both very closely with student entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs who aren't necessarily students. Um, and I see that there is definitely a, a big difference in how they approach problems. And I think I've noticed that in a variety of different industries, but mostly anything to do with technology. Um, and I think that's just because my generations grew up with technology. It's something that we've used basically since birth, and we never had to learn how to do it. It was just something that kind of came naturally to us because it was something that we've always had. In high school, I had computers and like college now, we have computers and tablets. And we notice all the little things, the little inconveniences. If something takes us five minutes instead of two seconds, we notice that. Where I think I see other founders who have not necessarily grown up with technology their whole life there's different ways that they come about different problems and the skill sets they have because of that helps them become founders that bring a more holistic view. Um, I was talking to a student founder like la two weeks ago now and his company that he brought, he was super excited about it, brought me this whole concept and everything. But when I started pressing him about maybe some of the other companies that are in space or gaps within the market. It was just things he hadn't considered because he didn't find it in his first 10 searches when he Googled it. Where it's like, I see older founders are people who have like done this whole ginormous thing. And when they come to me, have the most ginormous data rooms that we all have to kind of sort through as students to like look through, where I think others just haven't necessarily done that. And I don't think it's lack of experience. I think it's just something that they necessarily don't think is as important, maybe because they don't have that industry experience. Thank you, thank you. Um, just want a housekeeping detail. If you've got questions, if what we're saying prompts some questions that you want some further exploration, I'd encourage you to put those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And also to the fellow panelists to remind you if there's 
something that you'd like to add value to somebody else's comment, feel free to come off mic and I will uh, support you and call on you to answer and to add or contrast to the perspective. Because okay. um, I'm wondering if anybody, Kylie alluded it to it, the idea of this being a digital native and, and what that brings um, to their perspective and, and how they're, they're coming in and working with other folks. I'm wondering though, from a perspective of being a young entrepreneur or a young at heart entrepreneur, whether the vertical that you would choose to go into for your product or service or company, um, your platform, whether it would be an advantage or a disadvantage based on your age. Kumar, does any of your research support that one way or the other? Uh, definitely. Uh, you uh, the most successful founders are the people who know their domain. That is uh, the number one thing that, that guarantees success. So first of all, all founders, regardless of age, uh, share certain characteristics. Uh, you know, they need to be in, uh, you know, they need to have independence, they need to be risk takers, they need to have self-discipline, they need to have a tolerance for ambiguity, uh, they need to be able to view multiple uh, perspectives, uh, they need to be learners, as Max mentioned, uh, regardless of your age, you have to learn. So these things are common across uh, across everyone, uh, but knowledge of industry is is something that kind of separates a lot of people uh, because usually if you have a successful company, it's because you're providing some new kind of value. You're innovating. You're doing something that hasn't been done before, and the only way you can create new value is if you know what thing where things stand currently. So expecting to walk into a new space and say, okay, I'm just gonna create new value here. That's not gonna be uh, very likely to, to become successful regardless of age. Thank you. I, it's a good point to raise from the idea of value and creating value through your innovation. As founders starting up on your journey, regardless of what age you are, there's an aspect of communicating your value. And sometimes it's difficult for you, you, you meet with maybe possible resistance when you are communicating out your value in front of founders. Uh, uh, if, if I may just finish my point with an example, uh, the, since we're all here on this webinar using Zoom, a Zoom was founded by Eric Yon, a kind of a mid-career founder. He used to be the head of engineering at WebEx. Uh, so he's, he's a perfect example of this discussion we're having right now. He, he worked at a company. He, he had a lot of domain knowledge. He felt that WebEx was kind of uh, missing out on an opportunity by not being web-based. Uh, and, uh, and he tried to convince his management uh, that, hey, you know, we need to progress. We need to make WebEx better because customers aren't happy. We, we're just going behind. But typically, you know, Cisco, big companies are kind of slow and they didn't want resistant to change. And the only way he could have created the vision he had in mind and was going out and becoming an entrepreneur. And that kind of made him become an entrepreneur. Uh, and it connects to your point because when he left WebEx to found Zoom, he took all this institutional, all this domain knowledge that, that he had, and that's what led to his success. So I just wanted to share that. So sorry if I uh, interrupted. No, that's great color. I love storytelling. That's how people learn. And, and it really, you know, makes it all relevant and drives it home to say nothing of, you know, the relevancy of Zoom um, to just about everyone, right, at this point. So let's, I want to talk about um, innovation as involving creativity. And how does our ability to tap into creativity as a founder evolve or change as we age? Peter? Sure, I can start with that. So um, I, I think from an educational perspective, when we, we start measuring things like creativity, um, there's a general drop as, as uh, you go from preschool era, um, creativity is a generally wide open. Um, everything can become anything for a, a child. Uh, they can put on a sweatshirt and all of a sudden they feel they're faster. The creativity arrives and blocks turn into cities and everything can change. And um, that continues for a while. Then we get into school and then there, we start having some boundaries placed on us. You know, what time can we be creative? Where can we be creative? Um, so I, th I think these are some things that tend to happen and that 
creative outlet, or at least the, the validation of our creative time tends to be a little bit more restricted as we, we get older. And uh, one of the things that I, I get intrigued with when, you know, Kumar talking about stories, when I listen to stories, particularly from student entrepreneurs, there's always this kind of intersection. And I, I happened to be interviewing two students. Uh, they, they did their interviews back to back for a YouTube series I was doing. And both of them talked about when they were 13, spending time at their grandparents' house. That's when they would go into the back room and that's how they started basically the companies that they then started. They would get on a computer and there was just something about this authorization or validation that happened uh, when they were young that the if you want to be um, you know a, a YouTuber or an influencer, your grandparents never tend to really be the ones to say, no, 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 come on now. let's uh, let's focus up and and uh, pick a career pathway. they They tend to be really supportive of that. And one of the things that I wonder, and one of the things that I selfishly I would really like to have is a place as a 44, 45, 46 year old is I want to go to a place where I can have snacks and hang out and people can validate me being creative and having fun and exploring. And I, I don't know where we do that once we get past uh, those teens and early 20 years. I, we, we kind of lose access to some of those um, spaces. And, and again, I don't know that there's all that much in the recipe other than um, our creative endeavors are validated. We're not wasting time. We're not daydreaming, right? So daydreaming is just being creative. But eventually we start putting um, connotation on it that isn't as positive as it is when we were younger. So I, I, that's something I would really like to see is a, a place to go that we, we could all go after the event and hang out at somebody's grandparents' house, have snacks and uh, make cool stuff. I would like to say that you don't need to ask permission to be creative, but <laughs> that's great. Uh, right on. So, Zave, what do you think in terms of the uh, older populations that you work within in your startup? Um, I'm going to humbly disagree with Peter about creativity and declining as your age. As someone who's a lifelong creative, I work as a photographer and I'm a partner in a branding agency. Uh, at least for me, I can only speak from my own experience here. I'm not a, I've never researched it. Uh, creativity comes and goes over life. Um, there are years where there's a lot of pressure, where maybe it's family pressure, financial pressure, or health pressure, where your mind doesn't have the uh, bandwidth to be really creative. But then there are other times where things really come to you. I know for myself that once the kids left home, I had a whole renaissance of creativity. In fact, I would argue that I'm probably more creative now at my age than I have my whole life or maybe since in my 20s. So I think it comes and goes. And if you look at lot, like some really great artists like Leonard Cohen, for example, his last album that was recorded and released after he died, but recorded right before he died, is one of his greatest masterworks. Uh, yes, he had a few, you know, he recorded, I don't know, 10, 20 albums over his life. There were some that were great. There were some that were less great, you know, um, but I would, I would argue that his later work was as powerful as some of his very early work with ebbs and flows in between. So um, I just think it's it's the pressure, you know, where things come, but older people can be immensely creative um, because they can they don't have so many issues and problems that you have. And when you're middle-aged, I, I always think that each stage in one's life has its unique pleasures and its unique pains. I would love to have the physical strength I had when I was 20. I don't want the angst I had when I was 20. At 67, I am learned to be very comfortable in my own skin, but I'm not taking a 60 pound backpack and climbing a 6,000 foot hill anymore. You know, the things ebb and flow and you just have to work with the tools you have at a certain age. And later life can be an amazing creative, uh, creative spurt and an amazingly creative time, both artistically and in business. I think also that it speaks to that creativity is as a founder and scaling your business is creating that atmosphere that allows and supports the creativity. So which leads me to think about management styles as you're scaling and hiring your employees in the founder arena. How does that differ? How does the founder uh, at a young age management style different from perhaps the management style of an older founder. I'd like to ask Max if you have insight on this one. Yeah, no, um, absolutely do. And, and of course, once again, I, I can only speak to, to my own personal leadership style 
uh, you know, sort of with also some insights drawn from the leadership styles of the, the CEOs and founders that I've been fortunate enough to work for uh, and with in the past. I, I think that, you know, having had the opportunity to work at companies that have been founded by mid-career founders and even late career founders, um, I think that one of the things that I've noticed and one of the things that I've kind of taken and, and run with in a different direction now that I, I run my own company and run my own team is I put a lot of emphasis on maintaining a flat hierarchy. Um, which is not something that I saw in some of those other companies. Um, I think there were there were definitely some very you know stringent, strict, tiered hierarchies in in some of these other companies, regardless of their size, big company, small company um, that I worked for at the past, even at the early stages. Whereas I kind of touched on this earlier, being the age that I am, I haven't had time to learn and master every skill necessary to go to business. I mean, a very very few people could probably ever say that they have. Um, I like to try and stay cognizant of my strengths and of my weaknesses and acknowledge that the people on my team are, are f much, much better at certain things than I am. Um, and so with that in mind, I think keeping a flat hierarchy has been one of the things that's, that's made this work for us and made this work for our team. And I credit that for being the reason that we're so close and that we work so well together because it truly does foster a sense of, of belonging um, and a sense of importance with, with everybody that we work with. Uh, and I, I, I think that my team would tell you that as well. I certainly hope that they would. Um, and that's, that's just one thing that I think I've taken from my experience and then kind of diverged from uh, now that I'm, I'm sitting in that chair myself. Hey, Kumar, you have some, thank you, Max. You have something to add to that, Kumar, so you're off mute. Uh, so when we talk about creativity, uh, the thing to remember that what we consider, uh, what we call creativity is actually made up of two very specific things. One is creative potential and the other is creative achievement. And creative potential is the ability to come up with new ideas. And creative achievement is the ability to follow through on that creative urge. And for, for someone to be creative, both of these elements need to be present. And uh, s uh, some entrepreneurs, have both of these elements uh, in, in one person, in one body, which is fine, but there's no rule that both of these uh, attributes have to be in one person. And which is why some of the most successful companies have co-founders and e with each one bringing a specific set of skills. So if, if you find yourself uh, as the idea person or someone who's a, who can execute really well, there is absolutely no harm in finding someone who complements your skill sets and creating a successful venture. Good points raised, and I'm, I'm happy that you raised the issue of and the subject of co-founders. Kylie, I know you have some experience in the co-founder space. Uh, give me some insight into what you've observed in the co-founder when it comes to whether it's management style, communication, creativity. Yeah, so I was with a team of 30-year-olds, and um, obviously it's not that much of an age gap. I'm 21, so there's still a good amount, but um, there's definitely still some similarities. And I noticed a lot within like the management scope. I think we both had very different views as far as like how we wanted to be communicated to. He was someone who was totally okay with kind of just doing it all himself. He wanted to just kind of like roll with the punches when he got on a call and then off a call. Whether or not that information needed to be shared, he kind of just ended up rolling with it. Um, I'm someone, and now that we're like across the country from each other, that values collaboration. I feel that like when people are more informed, they'll be able to make more informed decisions across the whole board. Um, and I think Max kind of mentioned this, where he likes to have a management style where it's very linear, um, where everyone is kind of making decisions together. And I think that that's something that I've noticed as far as just how people are doing it at different ages. And I don't know if that's because they have much more experience at a corporate level where that's just the norm there is a hierarchy um versus when you're younger you're probably have not had experience at a big corporate level and maybe if you have it's still within like a tighter team um so it's just it just comes with experience and I think especially at the startup level it's super important to remember as far as just managing other people that information needs to constantly be shared because in the startup realm decisions are being made so much faster than I think in the corporate space and so I don't know if that's just from, again, industry experience where it comes from the norm over the past couple of years of, well, I've been in college, so I haven't necessarily had that corporate experience versus someone who has had that, where it's just something that they've been used to over the 
last couple of years versus I'm coming into it and seeing it from a new lens and saying, hey, I think that this would probably make more sense. Excellent points. And, and I know also I'm curious because we had this conversation in, in advance of the webinar on the idea of going into startups and Kumar gave the example of the likelihood that you would reach that unicorn stage and exit. Um, what do you see from the folks that are within the university or those that you're serving there? Um, what do they perceive as that success track that they're looking for? Yeah, that's a, a great point and something that I've, I've started to notice. And I don't know if that's necessarily just because it's within my ecosystem, or maybe if this is something more generalized, um, maybe everyone can kind of touch on this. But a lot of the founders who I've chatted with who are older, probably like 40s and on, are super obviously passionate about their startup and have the perspective of wanting to take it to a much, whether it's an IPO or an exit that is much later on, maybe Series B+, plus, where people who are younger, and I noticed this just recently with um, people who I think were 30, 30 to 35 year old team where they're started to adapt the model of serial entrepreneurship, where the thing that's most important to them is to be able to continue building, whether that is with just one idea for a short amount of time, multiple ideas at a short amount of time. But the main goal is basically just to be generating a lot of different ideas and it's not necessarily bringing it super long term. So I don't know if that's necessarily why these people at a younger age aren't bringing stuff to unicorn maybe it's just because they have that lack of attention span or maybe deep passion for the idea that they're kind of going into because I know me as I kind of reflect on myself I'm still at the stage where my attention span is very short I haven't found something that I'm so incredibly passionate about but I do love to build so I'm someone if I were to get into a project I just want to build for a short amount of time and then kind of pass it along and then that's kind of why I like to jump between a couple different things so that was just pattern I, I had started to kind of notice. Thank you. There's a lot in there that Kylie mm -hmm. gave us. Anybody else have a perspective based on what they're seeing? Peter, how about at your university? Yeah, sure. I, I think, Kylie, I think some of it is, um, particularly for, for young college age and even high school going into college, some of it's just uh, maybe they're not aware of the, the different pathways, right? So, you know, they, they get into something maybe because of... Um, and a personal interest. Um, I'm working with a student that has a, a growing um, drone company that does um, surveying for construction sites. And it all started because his uncle had a broken drone, handed it to him and said, you're really good with mechanics, figure it out. And he did. And within two years, he's gone from, you know, servicing his own personal drone to now getting contracts all across the state to do, you know, high level 3D mapping of construction sites. And I, I don't know that he's really had the time to sit down, like you talked about, Kyle, and say, where do I want to take, like, where is the destination for what's next for me? And I, I don't know that he's had the time. And I, I think Max, you even mentioned a little bit about the network, right? You, you have the network you have is what's proximal to you at that point in of your life. And some of it may be that, that maybe they just haven't crossed paths with enough people to um, shine a light on the different pathways. Thank you for that perspective. You know, I'm listening and I hear these numbers thrown out, you know, of, of, of old and, and what's young and what's old. I, you know, I was coming in preparing for this talk and I was thinking, you know, more seasoned entrepreneurs, we always joke that sweet spot would be, oh, it'd be 29 again. I'm not so sure we want to be 29 because you're like, it seems like you're like right on the cusp of old age at that point. So I'm not so sure where the sweet spot is, but not being able to carve out that continuum of you know where that sweet spot is, but I, I I'm hearing this advantages, uh, disadvantages, opportunities, obstacles at this side, and likewise on this side of the spectrum. I'm wondering if we could talk about the advantage to set ourselves up for success if we mix it. Now Max referenced it a little bit about adding to his team uh, from the standpoint of meeting with success, how can we mitigate those risks or perceived risks, whether we're talking to a funder or we're going out to market? Dave. Um, you know, one of the things I've done in my career as a photographer is I've stuck my nose in many, many businesses and spent days there. In fact, the last two days I've done that. And one thing I see with younger companies, with younger people, 
is they spend an awful lot of time reinventing the wheel. Um, I remember I was, I was at a very well-known search in, engine optimization company a few years ago. And there was, I, I happened to, to uh, walk into a conference room and there was about 12 people around the conference table. And one of the people raised their hand and said, well, what do we do if we're placing a ad for one of our customers, a digital ad for one of our customers, and it ends up on a less than savory website? What's our policy there? And I'm thinking to myself, this is 2019 and you're asking that question? That question was answered in 2008. And because no one in that room was much above 30, they were, sp they were spent hours debating something that was answered a long time ago, what you do there, what the policy should be. So I think companies that have a real diver uh, diversity in both um, age and race and outlook and cultural references are the strongest companies out there because they can bring to any issue, any problem, multiple avenues of possible solution, and not just one. You know, I think one of the, I'm gonna get slightly political here and I apologize. I think one of the problem with our political system is that it is, it is dominated by people who went to law school. And if you go to law school, you're trained to think a certain way so you know, if it's uh, if you're a hammer, everything becomes a nail. And I think diversity in thought and diversity in problem solving can be so uh, energizing for a company, for any institution, for that matter. So having a group of people working together who come from various backgrounds, various cultural references, various age and experience references will make your strongest companies. Great input. Uh Max, was there something in your experience um, with your company in terms of, is there an anecdote or a story that you share in terms of how having that balance or what seems like, whether it's a balance that you've achieved by your team or your advisors that have helped you meet with success and overcome the, you know, young perceived risk? Yeah, I, I'd be be really happy to. First, I want to acknowledge my my headphones just died, so now I'm I'm giving off big hoodie founder vibes with with the big over ear headphones here. Um, had to make the the switch mid call. Um, no, frankly, I I don't think that we would be where we are um, if it weren't for the strength of our mentorship team um, with uh, with our advisory group. I, I really don't. Um, I think that a lot of being a founder, a lot of finding success probably more than any founder would ever like to admit is we, we can call it luck or we can call it timing. Um, you know, I, I think being in the right place in the right time, meeting the right people who are in the right frame of mind at the right stage of life um, is, is so important. Uh, I, I actually like to like to tell people that if you ever want to, re, you know, restore some faith in humanity, start a business. Um, that's, that's been my experience because I, I have been fortunate enough to come across so many people since I started this venture that have given me so much and asked for so little. Um, some of them are on this phone call, you know, and it's, it's really been great to be able to work with certain people um, who have been able to shorten my learning curve uh, and also to de-risk me as a founder. Um, I think our, our first advisor uh, is a former VP of marketing for American Express, uh, VP of loyalty marketing for Staples, and super value supermarkets. Uh, our company initially launched in the loyalty space. We've since pivoted, um, but at the beginning, he was so key to opening doors that I'm not sure, and I'll never know, frankly, uh, because the fact is that he was involved and he was on the pitch deck and his headshot was there uh, during those early days. So I'll never know if those doors would have been opened for me at the beginning, if not for his presence and, and those like him that I've also been fortunate enough to add to that advisory group slide in the deck there. Um, but I think that, you know, being able to pick the brains of people who have been there and done it has shortened the learning curve for me in so many ways um, and allowed me to be a better founder, allowed me to be better for my company, for my team, um, and has helped us get to, to where we are today. I think, it's, I think it's a necessity for young founders, honestly, to be able to learn from and prioritize learning from those who have been there. Peter, you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, I think, Max, you, you brought up that concept of like just kind of bumping into the right person, having that right person on the team at the right moment. And it's sometimes 
Um, one of the things I, I share with, with students is um, we, we typically think of physics and physical systems as kind of having, uh, you know, natural tendencies. And those natural tendencies happen, happen to also have some chaos in them. So uh, there's systems sometimes that are in a mode of chaos, and you think that's as far away from normal as it could possibly be, except the, the it just actually needs the smallest little tweak to return that chaotic system back to stability. And I think the same thing happens for us um, as entrepreneurs, as mentors, as community members, is that it might just be we were at a cocktail party and we, we instead of turning to our left, we turned to our right. And that's where we met a person that said, yeah, I'd love to look at your pitch deck. And that's the thing that triggered it. And it was really not down to always planning or this nice, smooth growth curve. It was chaos. I turned left instead of right, maybe because I was holding a drink in my left hand and it was just more convenient to turn to my right. And that's how somebody joined my mentorship and founder team. And I think there needs to be kind of like an acceptance and maybe even a celebration of sometimes we, we got lucky and that that's actually a good thing. I knew luck was going to get thrown in there sometime uh, during this presentation. Max was talking about an advisor group or his team there. And I think about that as being a tool in his toolkit. What are some other tools that would be beneficial to have in your toolkit um, in particularly to kind of mitigate that perception of, of elevated risk or obstacles, whether you're on the young end or the older end. Uh, Kumar. So uh, the first thing I want to say before answering your question is listening to this previous discussion and listening to Max and Kylie who are 25 and 21 I feel very bullish about the next generation of business leaders. Uh, I mean, you guys are amazing. Uh, you know, just I can just tell from listening uh, at the clarity of you know of your thoughts. Uh, it's it's really amazing. Uh, but specifically, I think uh, uh, one of the things that that founders need uh, is this thing that I call intrinsic motivation. You have to do it because you want to create something valuable. You want to do something good. If you're doing it for the money or if you're doing it for the exit, uh, you're not going to get there. You know, if, if you're doing something for the, uh, for the money or, or only for the money, then you're going to be risk averse. You're going to make the wrong decisions and the wrong choices. So one of the things I'd advise every founder is, or every person who wants to start a company is, are you doing it for the right reason? And that goes for that type of questioning is regardless of what age you're at. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Independent, yeah. independent, that kind of insight and that internal awareness and checking in within ourselves is independent of age. So yeah, age, uh, age, as Max mentioned early on, has some pros and cons. You know, being younger has some advantages and disadvantages. Being older has some advantages and disadvantages. But founders, uh, regardless of age, have a lot more in common than they have, uh, uh, than they have uh, indifference. And I, I think to your point, when you're, you know, labeling it that intris, intrinsic value, um, again, gets to the, even the generalized value of what you're putting out there. Uh, leading with that is going to make you independent of age. You're thinking of success, hopefully, for those that are listening, that we have, you know, started the chip away and giving you that perspective that success is equated, regardless, it's not tied to one side of the equation or the other, whether you're old or young. I wanted to get into just a rapid round. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, a rapid round discussion or having um, our panelists go through. And I'm, this one I'm gonna ask of everybody. Uh, so I'm just gonna go around as I see them on the panel. Is to just give, you, give me your top. Um, the first one is essential of success for the young person. If you, 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 you want to give our listeners a takeaway, what's the, what you find is the top of your list to be essential, essential for success as a young person? I'm going to start with Z. Um, I want to jump on something Kumar said earlier and the importance, and this at any age, but especially with young people, the importance of passion. Um, business is tough. Art is tough. Creativity is tough you're going to have more failures and successes. But if you have a mission, if you have a North Star, 
if you know where you're going to go and you believe in the importance of getting there, it's going to give you a lot of that uh, energy and fortitude you're going to need to move forward down your path. But I think the most important is you have a mission and a passion for that mission. I mean, there are many issues in the world that I'm, I feel passionate about, but not necessarily their problems I want to solve. But if you have a mission for a problem that, that really um, feels important to you, that you have the wherewithal to solve it, and you're passionate about it, what the world's going to, to will, will uh, open up for you. Okay. And um, Kylie, what would you think is essential for success in a young person? What's your top takeaway? Um, I think it's honestly just to, to kind of like reflect on yourself. Um, I think the super interesting thing that I was talking to someone the other day is that four years ago, I would have been in high school. Eight years ago, I would have been in middle school. But someone who is a founder at 40 or even a founder at 60, four years ago, they might have been at Microsoft. They might have been writing a book. And so it's just reflecting on sometimes your perspective on life is going to be very different. And being able to understand that in a lot of times you do need to get a mentor, maybe you have a peer mentor, but then you have someone who is 10 years out, someone who's 20 years out, someone who's 30 years out, because there are different levels of creativity and it comes with your experience. And so I think being able to understand that your perspective is going to be different from someone else's perspective is key. Great point. Peter, you want to add to the discussion? In sure. Give me, give me your essential for success, whether you're a mature founder or a young founder. Um, I, right now, I'd say empathy, right? So, um, you know, understanding that there's a world beyond you. There are people that have feelings and emotions that aren't yours. And even if you can't necessarily connect or understand those, having um, a willingness to try to connect uh, with others on a deeper level, I think, is a, a critical component to um, really putting the foundation of why are we doing this? And, and ultimately, it's it's to help to connect with others and whether that's as customers, as partners, um, or it's just the, the problems that you're solving. I think empathy is a, a pathway that um, should be kind of exercised as much as, uh, you know, our physical and mental capacities can be. I love that. And I love that, you know, if you, you go to a checklist at a business school, you know, you might not have that as get out of college, be successful. Did you pack your empathy? You know, so uh, Max, how about you? This is this is a good question. Um, I think I think my answer would be Don. Don is going to get mad at me for this because I, I, he's he's one of several people who have told me that I need to hyperbolize a little bit more. That it might it might benefit me to hyperbolize a little bit more uh, sometimes, but it, it's not in my nature. So I'm going to say to stay grounded, um, stay grounded in reality. I think it's easy as a young founder to believe in yourself and what you're doing so much so that you sort of lose touch and 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 you know like peter just said almost lose empathy sometimes for the people around you that you're working with or the people around you that you're building what you're building for um i think that it's so important to find a way to stay grounded whether that's through having a strong advisory board or through having a direct conduit to the market itself to always be bringing in feedback from your, your, your customers and your partners and, and the people that are really gonna, gonna make this work because no matter how confident you are in yourself, no matter how much you believe in what you're doing, it's never gonna be a solo effort. You're always gonna need other people to buy in with you. Um, and I think that realizing that, that no one founder has all the answers and can do it all themselves is, is a really important thing to keep in mind no matter what stage you're at. keeping your feet firmly planted on the ground, even as you're scaling to new heights. Um, how about you, Kumar? So I think I, if there was one thing, I actually mentioned it, which is intrinsic motivation. But since I've talked about it, uh, I'll just bring up another thing that I've found uh, that's in common with every successful founder. And that is they didn't have a plan B. Uh, you have to be committed. You have to be all in. You can't go in thinking, hey, I'm going to try this. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to go and, you know, work with my family on their, you know, restaurant or whatever it is. You have to be 100% uh, committed to what you're doing because there are going to be hurdles. There are going to be obstacles you're going to face. And if you don't have the commitment, you're not going to get over them. Excellent. 
And with that, I'm thinking in terms of because you, you know, expertise within the realm of how to be exceptional. Um, how, how does how does my commitment to an entrepreneur either equip me or lead me to being exceptional? So I think uh, in, uh, to become exceptional, I think some of the things, uh, literally, when everyone went around the, uh, around saying uh, talking about the most essential thing. It, almost each one of them is a chapter in my book. So for example, you know, Max talked about teamwork. I have a chapter in the book called The Myth of the Solo Superstar. Uh, you know, we've talked about passion, you know, we've talked about all these things. So I think we're all on the, you know, everyone on this panel has, has given pieces of what it takes to become exceptional. And I think putting it together can really make you an uh, ultra successful founder. Would anybody like to add to that? Oh, now you've done it, Pam. You've given me an opening. Um, so but I think uh, you're not classified as anyone. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> go ahead, Don. All right, I'll go back on you. No, it's um, fine. So, um, <laughs> you know, th th thank you for the, you know, the, the the plug there, Max. Absolutely. You know, I I, I have encouraged you just because I'm, I'm such a huge fan to you know just be more. Um, you know, vocal about all the amazing things you've done. But uh, to your point, and, and this is something that uh, I was fortunate at a relatively young age, somebody once said to me, you know, here's some good wisdom for you, kid. You've got two ears, one mouth, you know, that is at most the ratio that you want to go. If you use the ears more than twice as much as the mouth, you will be very successful. It's something that a lot of people never learn. It's something that many of us learn later in life that, you know, we've talked over, you know, brilliant people that were trying to share some, some nuggets of wisdom and we just wanted to hear our own voice. And something that I think is probably part of the success of Kylie and Max and so on at, at these incredible young ages is, you know, in my interactions with both of you, um, you know, you have spoken when you felt, you know, that you had some, but seemed to me that you're always on the lookout for what can I learn from this person? You know, what, you know, information are they, you know, providing right now? And if it's not what I need, hey, Don, what do you think about this, right? Steer them in the right direction. And then maybe they'll share something valuable. So, you know, kudos to both of you for learning this. But I think that's something that entrepreneurs, young and old, um, don't pitch, don't yell, you know, when you have an opportunity. You know, again, Max, speak up because, you know, you're awesome. But uh, in the meantime, I see you sitting there just soaking in the wisdom and you're just going to be that much smarter tomorrow. You know, one thing I want to interject that I've discovered in the Philadelphia startup community is it is so supportive and people will go out of your way, out of their way uh, to help you out. You know, there's so many people have helped me on my journey for no remuneration. They don't care. They just are there. To offer support. And I found that, you know, going to, to organizations like the Founders Institute or Philly Startup Leaders or Venture Cafe is filled with people who will offer you support uh, and offer you wisdom. It is a really wonderful, mutually supportive community, in my opinion. Excellent. And I'd like to go to some questions at this point. Uh, one of the questions is, came in is the idea is when we, we started this program and we we're talking about, you know, ageism as like this collective, you know, or we're, you know, doing the collective, whether we're talking about all things young or all things older. Um, how does a unique perspective help shape the product and services? There's value in, I think what they're directing to, and if not, Cindy, you can put clarifying in there, the value of, of not losing sight of a unique perspective, regardless of age and how that impacts. Kumar? Uh, so every business, every, uh, every uh, venture's identity is the founder's unique perspective. It is not something, uh, it's, it's a unique perspective is not an add-on. It, it begins with that. 
And, uh, and I think that's essential because if you don't have your unique perspective, your unique stamp, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be a, a founder. You're doing it because you have an idea that's your own that you want to put into action. So, so absolutely, while we talk about all these other things, uh, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that you know, your unique perspective is, is kind of the driving element. Good point, good point, thank you. And um, as we're looking at our toolkit, uh, we made reference to building a network and we recognize that building a network can mean different things, you know, whether it's, you know, finding a mentor or tapping into your network to raise funds. Aside from joining everything and anything and deluding ourselves and, and just getting totally tapped out, what are some suggestions for new founders that to expand their network without racking up the membership fees or having to go to these conference attendance? I think it's a good question at different ages. Uh, you know, I was having this conversation with a younger founder, the idea that having been in business for decades, when I, if you fall asleep at the wheel, so to speak, with your network, you go in to leverage that LinkedIn or one of those networks and you realize that a lot of the folks that were walking alongside you um, and you know, either as mentors or peers or advocates are now retiring. So that it's one of these things that I'm finding that you need to constantly rebuild. But who has some tips on how we can build networks that support us and that um, we can support without overextending ourselves? Matt. As, as a young founder, I've found that building a network, I've never felt like there was a, a barrier to entry in the form of a cost. Um, I think that if you're opportunistic and that if you focus more on building relationships and less on how many LinkedIn connections you have, things will accelerate you know, for you in that department much more quickly. Um, I've only had the privilege of living in two cities, Philadelphia and Boston. Um, I know the term entrepreneurial ecosystem gets thrown around a lot, but in those two cities, I mean, that has absolutely been the case. Um, people in this world, people in the world of startups tend to know each other. They tend to talk, they tend to have connections within other organizations. If you can break in, you know, even just, just forge a relationship with someone who has a connection and, you know, it's called networking for a reason, right? You can, you can very quickly, you know, get your foot in the door in a lot of really interesting places full of a lot of like-minded people who, like I said earlier, you know, want to help people that are driven by what they're doing, that are excited to be building something. Um, so I would say, you know, don't underestimate cold outreach. Um, you know, write a, a nice a nice message on LinkedIn or, or a nice email uh, to somebody just talking about, you know, somebody that you know is entrepreneurially inclined, talking about how passionate you are about what you're doing, or even just that you're looking to, to learn more about what it takes to start and grow a business. Um, you know, I think the people in this world, the people in this space take very kindly to earnest expression of that. And uh, that that's something that that can be used to very quickly and easily make the types of connections that can grow into more and more and more networking opportunities. Great, when, thanks, Peter. Um, you have, wait, Dave, Peter, weigh in. Oh, sorry, sorry, Dave. Um, Dave well, has better things to say than first. I do. Why? Uh, it's a Maybe protocol here, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Dave always has better things to say anyway. But we we go to the same stylist, so it doesn't doesn't much matter. Um, so I, I was just going to kind of build on what Max was saying about um, relationships. And I, I think the way I've been kind of hearing it phrased is uh, relationship before partnership. So, you know, getting to know each other, um, figuring out people's values, their their behaviors, um, and, and not asking for that, you know, will you be a mentor, a kind of too soon thing, right? So the people that, that you want to be um, supporting you, I think they really need to understand not, not necessarily what only the business is, but why are you doing it? What what are some of the things that you value um, in your personal system as they uh, become part of that uh, guidance team around you? Sorry, Zayf, now over to you. When I was younger and I used to go to networking events, my goal was see what I can get. Who can I meet? Who can feed me? Who can feed me? Who can feed me? And they were very frustrating and uh, to go to. And then later in life, I pivoted my attitude and I would go to networking events just to learn what I can learn and just to be out of curiosity and to see what I could offer other people. And that change of attitude from getting to giving at networking events 
made them a much more enjoyable and be much more productive. So don't go to networking events to get, go to networking events to learn and to give. Wonderful. And I, I think that um, is a nice way to highlight the value of networks that you build. And I'm proud to be a part of the Founder Institute, which is a global organization that provides that net to network, to build your net worth within. And I'm happy to be part of the local chapter here, the Founders Institute Keystone, uh, where Pre-Seed Accelerator is our main foundational of a program where we run these cohorts of this little MBA to get all the tools you need, whether they're physical tools or they're you know, uh, mental mastery type tools for the mindset to be successful at any age as a founder. But it's also the access. We give you a ready-made network of business mentors that support you in this journey. And once you're kind of in that Founder Institute ecosystem, there are no geographic boundaries as to where you can go with your startup, whether you're pre-seed or tap back into the expertise after you've been successful in subsequent rounds of fundings and elevated scales. I want to thank uh, my fellow um, panelists here for sharing their time, their insight, the information, their expertise. I would, wouldn't be able to do this without that valuable insight. We're also pleased that I could have the support of Don and Bill and Daria uh, who support us in our leadership journey here through Founder Institute to say nothing of the wizardry on the back end of the webinar. So if you haven't already done so in registering for this event, make sure that you're following us on social media. You can find us on LinkedIn, Founders Institute Keystone. You can find us on Twitter, and that'll help keep you informed of our future events that we have coming up, as well as the foundational program to help support you in your founder journey. So again, Don, do you have anything to add? Otherwise, I'll close it out. Um, no, thank you for that. I, I guess one of the things I was just going to comment on about that, that last question and, and, and the point that you were making is um, it's been a joy to watch our cohorts when we've had people of every background, every age, you know, race, creed, color, size, um, doesn't matter. And we put them together in teams and how well they work together, learn from each other. Um, and yeah, we have a great, very diverse mentor base as well. So um, yeah, I, I would encourage people to, um, you know, kick the tires, right? See, you know, if it's not FI, there are, you know, again, many wonderful groups in, in the Philly area and, and you know, global. Um, look, find the organization that has what you're looking for, what you need, you think, and test it out. Hopefully there's a way to test it out. And, you know, again, what we have seen is that we get to be a big family. And, um, you know, I have made, you know, close friends of, of people, you know, every age range, you know, through, through our cohort, um, and have enjoyed it, and hopefully added some value. So thank you. Thank you, Don. And I would invite everybody to start building that network right now by following the individuals that have been presenting their expertise here tonight. You can find all of us on LinkedIn, it would be a great starting point. And um, you can get added resources by, I'm sure all of them would be open to being receptive to receiving your messages and helping out. Uh, so if hopefully you've made a lot of notes and you found value, and that your key takeaway, you might have several of them, but I want everybody, regardless of what age you are and what stage you're at in your founder journey to realize and write at the top of your page that success has no boundaries, success has no limits when it comes to age and value spreads across the continuum of age. So I wanna thank you for joining us and I look forward to seeing you again on another Founder Institute Keystone event. Thank you. So Pam, I don't know if, I mean, certainly anybody needs to drop. Otherwise uh, we, you know, uh, if you, you know, want us to, you know, allow 
attendees to speak and interact, we can have a little bit of a, we got a, you know, small enough group remaining here that we could chit chat, um, um, you know, have some interaction or, uh, you know, again, anybody who needs to drop, certainly thank you for staying this late. I was monitoring the questions and I didn't see any questions coming forth so that uh, if people would like to entertain if there's something. Oh, um, so the one thing that I didn't know is uh, apparently when the stuff goes into the Q&A, if somebody answers it um, uh, via text, then it goes to a different category. It's now considered answered. I did review those, I thought. Uh, okay, thank you. Those up. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes. I am unmuting people. If you have anything to share, by all means. And again, um, now this is an open forum, so um, you know if you need to drop, we certainly understand and appreciate your. Um, uh, thank you, Natalia. Um, need to give out the Zoom link for our uh, open house. Uh, on Friday and Saturday. And while we're doing that, Bill, perhaps you can uh, stop the recording at this point and we'll make it easier when 